The topic for July 2018 for the Pathwork Steps self-study guide and online meetings was Pathwork Lecture 94, which is the true self versus superficial levels of the personality. The month prior, we did Pathwork Lecture 93. I don't normally do lectures in sequence, but in this case, I thought it was particularly supportive because when we did Pathwork Lecture 93 on main image, main image is a difficult concept, a complex concept, and I wanted to keep it unfolding. I wanted to stay in the same area so that the questions that we proposed, the questions that we asked and explored in June would continue through July. I also picked an August topic that was conducive to continuing the conversation. And the reason for that is that main images are a foundation stone of beliefs, of systems that we have created in order to live life well. And where that relates to true self is that a main image is like a superstructure that rests on some fundamental principles and beliefs. Those fundamental and principles and beliefs, if they're correct and aligned with truth, then they stand. But some of them do not stand. They are not aligned with truth. Some of the principles that we have all built our lives on are based on the conclusions of a two, three, or four-year-old. Now, I'm still working with true self, but I'm introducing the idea by working with ideas from main images. Over the last two to three months, because I'm recording this rather late in September, participants in the online meetings have been more and more able to verbalize ways in which they realize that how they are living their lives is not who they really are. For instance, one person said that they realized that they were trying so hard to be an antithesis, to be the opposite of their mother, that they didn't realize that they were spending all their effort being that opposite instead of trying to find out who they actually were. In other words, out of fear of becoming someone whom we do not admire, who we perceive as not who we wish to be. Out of fear of being that, we are leaning so far away that we, we miss out on who we are. It's because we're children. And children want to be as far away as possible from danger. As adults, we are more able to stand right next to such danger. We are able to see subtleties. We are able to understand that there is a clear difference between uh, a mild tendency to something and blind action in the same way. So in other words, as adults, we can be slightly uh, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, as OCD stands for that. As adults, we can be slightly compulsive about some things on occasion, but that does not mean that we have OCD. It does not mean that we are obsessive compulsive, but we can recognize similarities in the actual mental diagnostic disease to what we're doing. And we can joke about it. I'm being a little schizophrenic. I am being a little OCD. I'm being a little paranoid. And that's a healthy recognition because such mental diseases are actually extremes on a spectrum. <clears throat> Again, as adults, we can hold that subtle place next to uh, being like something that we don't admire and understand the differences. But as children, we want a large space between us and the person that we do not admire. So sometimes when we're learning uh, 
concepts like this. It's important to rattle our cage. It's important to uh, give the feeling of this superstructure that we've created, of the personality and the preferences that we've created. You need to give a sense that this is not absolutely who we are before we can start to look at who we are. So in <clears throat> Pathbook Lecture 94, the guide speaks of the true self as the divine spark. Now that's a little lofty. For many of us, that can feel a bit foreign. And it sounds as if, well, that's perfect, and I know I'm not perfect, so I cannot be a divine spark. But that's not what is meant. What is meant is that there is a divine spark at the center of us. And then there are superficial layers built on top of that, based upon a lot of things, based upon culturalization, socialization, how we need to live in the world, may, be, have, it may need to compromise with who our unique spark is, for instance. I am a very private person, but I know that I need to be somewhat social. There's a, it's a compromise to be social in a genuine, caring, loving sense without following the example of other people. So I can find my way towards being mildly social while I still honor my personal sense of, of or my personal reality of being somewhat of an introvert. As a child, however, if I don't know who I am, then I might be talked into behaving in a way <coughs> behaving in a way that is antithetical to who I am, to develop habits that are uncomfortable, but they please others. And as time goes on, I may forget that discomfort and rely more on outside approval and outside interaction than attempting to honor my inner essential divine nature. So this lecture is about having some respect for that, of not being afraid of it, not relying on it totally. The divine spark is not meant to go to work to do the laundry. The divine spark is meant to be a support, a, an inspiration about who you are in your essence that informs all the other things that go on in your life. Um, the guide teaches that the divine spark is nearer than you realize, that it's not a slog to get there, that we can access our divine spark with just a few moments of careful, meditation, or reflection. He also advises that these divine, this divine spark in us, these divine sparks, actually manifest in many aspects of our lives without our realizing it. And he suggests that in areas of your life where life flows, where it's genuinely positive and constructive, uh, that that's more of your divine spark uh, manifesting than in the areas where you have dysfunction, unhappiness, or struggle. <clears throat> Fighting a cold today. Um, in the second section of the study guide, uh, we focus on how ten tension and anxiety result from the superficial self. And the summary here is, it's not what you do that matters. It's how you do it, or in another lecture, the guide describes, it's the intention with which you do it. So in other words, one of the ways to find out the difference between your superficial personality level and your divine spark is to look at how you do something. Do you do it with a full heart? Do you do it with grace? Is it easy? Is it effortless? Or do you struggle with it? If you struggle with it, there is a possibility that what you're trying to do is compromise too far from your real self to meet the needs of the outside world. 
to accommodate others. So to look at not specifically what you are doing, but how you are doing it. Is there grace there? Is there ease? Or is there struggle? And when we do work together, we only work on the areas where there is struggle. And I keep reminding people that there are multitudes of things that happen in their lives where they don't have to think about it. They don't have to worry about it. It's not negative. It's not dysfunctional. It's not destructive or deconstructive. Many aspects of our lives work well. Our attention tends to get focused on the aspects where life does not work well, where there is tension and anxiety. The third section of this lecture was on sin and neurosis, meaning that there's a spectrum. And uh, neurosis or mental disease and negative intention is on one end, uh, not that I'm conflating the two. But such things are on the extreme end of the spectrum. The majority of people that I interact with do not have a specific negative intent to harm. Negative intent is defined by the guide as knowing that you are behaving negatively, that you are going to cause harm, and not caring. In other words, deliberate negativity is a negative intention. Most of the people that I work with do not have a deliberate negative intention. However, they may be entrapped in certain negative solutions, negative uh, dynamics. In the intent to do something positive and getting lost in, in what pleases who and how I can, how I can get what I want, they be, it's like a maze and they've gotten lost in the maze. In terms of mental illness, as I said before, we all have some recognition of elements of mental disease. And what he means when, what I mean when I say it's on a spectrum, is that you can recognize some elements. You can recognize an aspect of paranoia without being paranoid. That um, to recognize that you are a little selfish does not mean you are utterly selfish. And part of this work is to begin to distinguish the difference between utter selfishness and being self-centered in the moment. So using the example of a child who's trying to differentiate itself from a parent that it does not admire or whom it is afraid of. Just because you look like your parent or sound like your parent or act like your parent does not mean you are your parent. It does mean that the discernment is difficult, that it's subtle, that it takes care and skill to differentiate. And as a small child, we don't have those skills. So we react by creating a big difference between us and them. <clears throat> In the section on images, when we come up with that kind of solution, us and them, I am me and she is she, and there's a big gulf between us, and that makes me feel safe. That's a tempor uh, useful temporarily, but it gets in the way when you become an adult. It gets in the way because you're being too extreme in your analysis. You're being too crass in how you see a situation. Main image is about the fact that we have built an idea up in our lives and that we are operating on that idea without being aware of it any longer. So this is why the guide brings in the idea of sin and neurosis to explain that these are extremes and that we must differentiate between a momentary lapse of judgment, being selfish in one moment, uh, being greedy in one moment versus a fear that we are sinful, that we are greedy and our core nature is greedy. And the last section talks about split concepts create confusion, meaning that uh, by, by not understanding something fully, we leave areas of confusion. And in area of confusion, we do not operate smoothly and cleanly. We do not make our decisions easily and effortlessly. 
and we can get lost. Now, if I sum up this whole lecture, uh, I, I look for larger metaphors or larger ways to explain true self versus superficial levels of personality. And one of the ones that I found and I use in various worksheets is an article that originated uh, or was talked about in the New York Times. It has a different source. And its title was How to Fall in Love with Anyone. And the idea was that you uh, ask someone 36 questions and then you stare into their eyes for five minutes and you can fall in love with anyone. And uh, I noticed in one episode of The Big Bang Theory that they used this. They used this between two characters that had been somewhat antagonistic for a long time and they played this game. And it worked. Now, why does that, why do I bring that up in the context of this lecture? That parlor game works for the same reason that we can fall in love with someone that we do not totally admire, who has a lot of character defects, who is troubled, who engages in destructive activity or encourages us to engage in destructive activity. The essence of this is that there is a, a moment when you can see someone's true self. And we, we can fall in love with that. Not that we are falling in love with that woman or that man. We're falling in love with the divine that we resonate with. This happens to me on a regular basis with clients that I work with. It's a hard thing to express. Uh, it can be misunderstood. But there isn't anybody that I won't fall in love with if I can manage to see their divine spark. Now, I can intuit divine sparks. I know that there's a divine spark in everyone. I can have faith in that. But to actually be in the presence of someone in their vulnerability, in their deep caring, in their struggle to be the best human being they know how to be, even if there is a lot of ignorance there and they don't know how to manifest that. To tune into someone's positive intention to their longing to bring themselves more fully in the world. How can you not fall in love with that divine being? I use those words, but again, that's not about the romantic concept of falling in love. It's more about resonating with the true nature of someone. So I use that example as a way where we can, in our daily lives, recognize that we do have the capacity to sense into true self, our own and that of others that we have done so throughout our lives. That there may be fear that that's a goal, but we're far from it, so we'll just work over here and do the best we can. Instead of keeping that goal present in our mind on a constant level. To not be dissuaded by the fact that we have idiosyncrasies, that we're a little neurotic, that we're a little sinful. Understanding that those are lapses, momentary lapses. And that we are not essentially who we are just because in the moment we are short-sighted, frightened, greedy, or angry, resentful. That these are moments and we can move past them. So this is just a short flavor of Patrick Lecture 94, True Self versus Superficial Layers of the Personality. Now, in the study guides, I may have 10 pages, but I include other lectures and I include other references to, to, to metaphor it out. Uh, and so I encourage you to go back to the source material, to the original lecture, and take a look at it. Thank you for listening.